All right, welcome to another Scholar Spotlight. I'm Princess Agina, the Community and Project Management Executive at the Late Law Foundation. And our special guest today for our spotlight is Gitika. Gitika, do you mind introducing yourself and the university you attend? Yeah, um, so my name is Gitika, but everyone calls me Aki. And I am going into my second year at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Awesome. Okay, so Aki, can you share with us um, the title of your research and also just a brief just overview of what your research is about and kind of its real world impact? Yeah, of course. So the title of my project is The Queer Lives of Asia, the Histories of South and East Asian LGBTQ plus communities, but I usually just call it Queer Lives of Asia because I think that's a bit more concise and fun. And Broadly, I am looking at the last 200 to 300 years of history um, concerning queer communities in South and East Asian countries. My case study countries are India and Japan, so most of my research is focused there. And I'm looking at a few different areas, but the most kind of prominent of those um, is I'm looking at how colonialism and the colonial era impacted the kind of societal, political and legal status of queer communities in these countries. So for example, in India, I'm specifically looking at the um, impact of British imported laws and British imported cultures on Indian societal attitudes towards queer communities. And I'm trying to tie that together with the current day because I'm a student of modern history and economics, but modern history is kind of where my project is, is lying or sitting under. So I am trying to look at how the last 200 to 300 years have shaped the current status of queer communities and how they are currently perceived and how they are currently existing. That is really interesting. When I saw your Thank blog you. post, I was like blown away because it just was so fascinating and just incredible. First of all, you're an incredible writer, but also just the journey that you took the readers on was intriguing. Um, so you. can you share kind of what your... Um, inspiration was or what your passion where your passion for this particular research focus originated from yeah of course so i think there's kind of two different angles to the story and eventually they come together but i'll i'll share them as two separate stories at first so firstly of course i think i have a personal connection to this as i think a lot of late law scholars do research is born out of your personal identity and your personal passion to some extent so I myself, am, I do identify with the queer community and I am South Asian. Um, my parents are from India. I was born and brought up in the US, but I, I still have family in India um, extensively. So I think definitely part of this project was uh, me wanting to understand my own history and where I come from. Because growing up in California, I had a very easy time of things. I was very lucky and very privileged to have parents who have been quite accepting of me and have friends who have been quite accepting of me. Um, but obviously the queer history that I was learning about was very much centered on the US and the West in general, which I think is really good. I think it's great that California has so much queer history in the curriculums for high schools. Um, I learned a lot about Stonewall. I learned a lot about different censorship codes through you know, the 20th century America and things like that but it didn't really help me feel connected to a community that I was part of in the sense where my history has a portion of it, which is from South Asia. And I never really knew too much about that. So part of it was a personal drive to want to know that. And also I think when you grow up queer in a South Asian family, there's obviously the biggest hurdle you face is how do you tell your family? Um, not mm. even like for me, as I mentioned, my immediate family was very easy and I knew they would be accepting but my extended family was kind of the bigger challenge in terms of not knowing how they would react. And I have to say, I, I obviously know this is not the experience for everyone, unfortunately, but I was so amazingly surprised in a good way when I told my like grandmother, my grandfather about, you know, the relationships I had been go having or dates I'd been going on with women. Mm. They were so open and accepting to it. And it was quite surprising to me because I had heard so many negative stories um, of friends who had had experiences even with their own parents. So it kind of opened my eyes to the fact that societies that we assume to be wholly conservative um, and historically conservative may have more complicated histories than mm -hmm. what's immediately obvious. 
so that was kind of one side of the story which had been brewing in my head for the last you know 10 or so years the other side of it is more academic um, and that has to do a little bit more with like american politics and current events in the sense where this is i believe in 2020 but uh, my dates might be wrong but recently in the past four or five years there's been a upturn in the number of anti-lgbtq plus policies in parts of the us yeah. um, specifically in places like florida or texas and one of the big ones was this bill that was called the um, don't say gay bill that's what it's kind of commonly known as which emerged in florida a few years ago and essentially heavily restricts discussions of gender and sexuality in classroom settings and oh. again coming from california i've had the privilege of being in a setting where i was taught about my identity growing up so i never quite felt like disconnected from it i never felt uneducated about it because i had that support and i had that privilege but at the same time i knew how important it was um mm. i knew how important it was for me to be able to go into a classroom and talk about who I was and, you know, in our English classes, read books that were written by queer authors about queer people mm. in history, have queer history represented in that. So when the bills came out um, in Florida and in Texas, it was, I think, a shock to the system in a way. Mm. And I think obviously when you hear about something like that on the news and you're a little bit far from it, but you know people who are connected to it and you're in the country that's happening, there is a want to try and do something about it, but also a bit of a struggle where um, I didn't quite know how to do, I didn't know how to do something about it, right? Yeah. I didn't know what the immediate path was. And for me, the solution I found to that was to kind of approach it from a more historical angle um, and to kind of understand the history of queer censorship and how it has affected this community for the last thousands of years, the you know, last thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. Um, but also how people have worked within that, almost in the sense where you get a sense of hope from that. Because mm. when you look at how communities have endured similar things in the past, you are you're reaffirming that okay, we can endure it now as well. So yeah. my senior year of high school, I wrote um, about a sixty thousand word book about the history of queer censorship in the West. And this ranged all the way from ancient Greco-Roman societies to 21st century YA yeah. literature um, and kind of tracing the development of censorship from religious bodies, um, from social bodies and how authors had worked around it historically. So my favorite example of this is um, Ian Forster who Obviously, he's quite a famous author, but his book Maurice is one of the defining queer books um, of the 20th century. Tw yeah, 20th century. And <laughs> my favorite story about this is that the book was actually completed in the early 20th century, but due to censorship codes that still existed in the UK and in the US, he refused to have it published until the end of the century because his public publishers were telling him that the only way they could get it published is if he gave the book an unhappy ending and he was wow. like this defeats the entire point i'm trying to talk about queer joy i'm trying to talk about the fact that you can't have two men in a relationship who have happiness so he just refused to have the book published um, and i think that's always a really powerful story to me the the power of happy endings right that you can yeah. make a statement um, in that way. So I looked looking at a lot of authors like that, um, who had kind of represented queerness in many different shapes and forms and, and varieties throughout history. And I think that was a very eye opening project. I'm sure if I redid the project now, I might approach parts of it differently. It was a learning process as well. But it was mm. very educational. And I had a wonderful time working on it. And I had a wonderful time writing it. And then within that, I that project was very much focused on the West. So when it came to kind of thinking about what I wanted to do for my Laidlaw project, I started bringing together the aspects of my own personal identity that I'd been thinking about with this academic interest in gender and sexuality and media representation, which had kind of grown more recently. And I decided to pull those together and keep the same academic sphere and keep the same academic range, but have it be more focused on an area of the world that I could personally connect to. That's very interesting. So a few thoughts came to mind when you uh, just spoke now. So one, I'm from Houston, Texas, 
and it's just so shameful that we are going backwards like it's yeah. so sad it's like taking one step forward and then 10 steps back um so yeah it's it's very unfortunate um but yeah like you said it's also good to reflect on history to see how people have overcome these mm -hmm. challenges and this ignorance and all of that stuff um and kind of pull from that those experiences as inspiration um the other piece that was interesting is that what you said um about a narrow view of how people want to paint a specific identity and it reminds me of um someone who also did scholar spotlight um Oana, I'm hopefully forgive me if I'm pronouncing her name incorrectly, but O A N A Tosca from uh, Trinity College Dublin, and she was a third year English student at TCD, and she uh, did her research project on uh, inspired by the dangers of a single story. So looking at the way yeah. that stories are told um, about African Americans in particular in the Black diaspora, um, and how that, uh, like you said, like this um, aim to paint a specific community in a very specific yes. way. And that's the only way that they want those stories to be told. So it's, mm -hmm. it is very empowering to give the, the yeah. that power back to the community and also shed these other diverse perspectives. Um, yeah, so very interesting yeah. indeed. Um, and then, so my question I want to ask is you mentioned a bit about uh, challenges that you may have encountered. So what has been the biggest challenge that you've encountered in your research and even in your leadership journey so far and what have you learned from it? Yeah, um, well, I think there's like an answer to the research portion and then an answer to the leadership portion. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge I've been facing on a research standpoint, which is a challenge I very much anticipated, is what we call archival absence in the sense where Unfortunately, because homosexuality has been criminalized in both India and Japan, um, it is no longer, but it has been. There's a lack of primary sources and a lack of secondary sources when it comes to doing source-based research. You know, in the from the time of the British Raj up until 2018 in India, when homosexuality was decriminalized, there just isn't that much writing out there because it was illegal. So I think that's the most immediate challenge on a research standpoint is that you're trying to research something which isn't there almost in a sense mm. where it's not obvious it's not like i can go to the library and look up you know queer stories from 1900s in india and i'm not going to get a whole bunch of sources so yeah. the good thing is that again i think in gender and sexuality studies this is a problem which is quite common um mm. because there has been censorship across the globe in various types and forms, but it's also a problem that people have been learning how to address. Um, I think mainly through the fact that sources for my project may not be conventional. You know, I'm going to be looking at mythology, I'm going to be looking at religious texts, I'm going to be looking at legal texts. And so it really just means that when you're approaching a project, you have to look at it from a more interdisciplinary view and you have to look at different things that may offer you insight in a less direct way you may need to look at different forms of symbolism um, or coding mm -hmm. or things like that so even though that's a problem it's not something i'm super worried about because again it's something my and my, myself and my supervisor very much anticipated so it's more of like a puzzle of trying to figure out where is your information and also mm -hmm. because the nature of my project is very much interview based i have source material which is quite new um, and only really available to myself so far because I'm, I've just gone into the interviews. Oh, From yeah. a leadership standpoint, um, I have not started the leadership component of my project yet. That's my next year component. But obviously, I think the leadership that, you know, we build is, is present throughout the project. I don't think it's split into research yeah. and then leadership. Um, so far, I think the biggest leadership challenge that I've been facing um, is kind of I'm trying to find the right way to word this, but it's uh, like being comfortable with rejection in a sense, mm -hmm. um, in in a very specific way in that like, I think I'm quite introverted as a person. So when I had to take on a project, which, you know, I designed this project where the first, the first thing I had to do was send a lot of cold emails out asking people to let me interview them mm. that was like an immediate whoa 
I, I don't like doing this. You know, it's not something I'm necessarily comfortable with instinctively. Yeah. Um, because you're opening yourself up to the fact that you may bother someone or someone may not want to hear from you and things like that. So it's a lot of like personal insecurity. But then I think I sent out about 200 cold emails. Wow. Good for you. Just, you know, once you start doing it, it's almost like practice makes perfect. And, you know, I heard back from some people who did say no I heard back from people who were like no we would rather not be involved in this or you know this isn't something that we're open to doing or just you know people who didn't respond and obviously it's it's not like it's an easy thing to hear obviously I want as many people to be involved in this as possible Mm -hmm. but I think just understanding that it's okay for people to say no and it doesn't mean anything about the project. It doesn't mean anything about me. It's just that this is not the right thing for everyone at this time. And also yeah. putting energy and putting attention into the people who said yes, right? Yes. And understanding that mm-hmm. um, even though it may be one person saying yes for every 20 people who don't respond or say no, that's still one person who's saying yes. And they deserve my entire attention and they deserve my entire effort. So I think it's just kind of reframing perspective and also making, getting myself comfortable to the idea of of rejection in a sense. Um, And it's something which I think it's been a lot easier than I thought, uh, partly because I have a wonderful supervisor who is very, very supportive and very kind and um, very much listens to me whenever I get frustrated about these things. I think the most challenging experience of this I had was actually when I was in Tokyo and I had a meeting scheduled for what I thought was Friday, and I was quite sure that I had confirmed Friday several times um, mm. in Osaka. And I'm not sure if you've been to Japan before, but no, um, I haven't. It's on my list. <laughs> I highly recommend. It's very fun. Um, but I was staying in Tokyo, but I knew I had a couple of people I was meeting in Kyoto and Osaka. But Kyoto is about a two-hour train ride, and Osaka is three. So I had scheduled Mm. it so they were on the same day because they're in the same direction. So I'd go down to Kyoto and then go to Osaka and then come back to Tokyo from Osaka straight. I bought my Mm. train tickets. Everything was set. Um, And then the day before, on Thursday, I get an email from the person I thought I was meeting in Osaka. um, And he's like, I'm at the place. Where are you? And I was like, "Uh, I'm in Tokyo. I'm I'm three hours away. Like, I thought we were meeting tomorrow. Um, and it turns out there had just been a very good old fashioned miscommunication where I uh, had in fact said Friday multiple times and somehow he had read Thursday from this. He had tried <laughs> to send me a Google invite. I have a Microsoft Teams account. I don't always get uh, Google invites. Um, yeah. So it's just, it was the most innocent things that like something went wrong in the sense, but unfortunately it did mean that that interview could not go ahead because um, you know, he wasn't able to come the next day. I obviously mm. could not make it down to Osaka within two minutes. Um, yeah. And so just kind of understanding that those things will happen when you're doing field research and understanding that the other person may be frustrated, but that's okay. Um, and you just have to kind of move forward and look at the next thing. Um, because for me as a person, it was very easy to kind of just, oh man, how could I do that? That's so silly. Like, why I hope they're not upset and rather just kind of be like oh okay it happened I'm really sorry um what's next yeah so I think that was definitely a a change in mindset that I had to learn that is an amazing like lesson like both of those things so the kind of like dust yourself off mindset I don't know how to (laughs) word that but I'll word that better (laughs) but yeah like yeah because oftentimes it is easy to get stuck on like a mistake or stuck on something not working out and yeah, exactly. that goes into your next point of like reframing perspective so not just reframing your perspective of okay it happened it's time to just move on like you know whatever and not getting stuck on okay how could he make this mistake or you know whatever um so that's a great mindset but also like going back to the reframing perspective specifically I see that so often I feel like many people see that so often with in our own lives or even like celebrities, um, way to invest in celebrity lives sometimes. But something that irks me a lot of times is when like celebrities like uh, comment on people who are commenting negative, but they're ignoring all the positive like comments. Yeah. I'm just like, okay, you're you're upset about this one person who said they don't like your music. 
as opposed yeah. to the millions and millions of people who are like raving about your music and supporting you. And so, yeah, that's, I've been trying to like reflect on that own, that lesson for my, my own life as well. Just like not looking at the one, I don't know if you've ever seen this like meme or like this, uh, yeah, this picture where it's like this girl in this field and there are like hundreds, like thousands of flowers blooming and she's like looking like sadly at this one flower that's wilted in the field. Yeah, I think I think I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. so I, I always mean, try to picture that. I understand it because by nature, I am also a perfectionist. I think a lot of people are. Um, yeah. And it's really, really easy and instinctive to look at the one thing that's going wrong. Yeah. Um, so I think the thing is, oh, over the past month, I think the biggest lesson I've learned in terms of just basic leadership skills is not everything is going to go perfectly and that's okay and that's fine yeah. and it's you know 98 percent of this has gone wonderfully and two percent has gone less wonderfully that's a great that's a great outcome you know yeah it's, absolutely. that is better than i could have hoped for so i think that's just kind of been a, like almost like a mantra that i have to keep telling myself like it's okay yes it's fine same same and okay, so you have those two lessons, um, which I'll just for now call dust yourself off and then reframing perspectives. Uh, are there any other top leadership tips that you can give to our viewers? Yeah. Um, well, I don't really consider myself an expert on leadership by any means. So like with a grain of salt, but here's what I think I always try to remind myself. Um, firstly, leadership to me is about people. Um, it's not about me, like, uh, especially I think in a project like mine, where so much of what I'm doing is going and talking to people, I have to remind myself that leadership is about them. And mm. it's about you doing your best to connect with people and help people. So obviously, inner growth is a wonderful thing. And I think it's something that people should focus on. But I think first and foremost, remembering the context of where you're working. Um, mm. And kind of understanding people's situations and understanding people's lives is just inherent to leadership. You, if you're traveling to a new country, you have to understand where people are coming from in that country. You have to be open to the fact that people's lives and experiences and opinions are going to be different than your own. Mm. And people might disagree with you. And it is your job to build connections despite that. Yeah. Or not even despite that, for that. Right. Mm -hmm. I think the whole point of leadership is to build connections with differences. Like if everyone yeah. thought the exact same way, we'd have a very boring robotic society. Mm -hmm. It is the fact that people have different lives and different experiences, which make us interesting and make us able to move forward because you're able to take this variety of experience and take things from each side of that. You know, mm -hmm. so I was going to countries where I was a bit nervous because I'm going to India and I'm not sure whether I'm going to be received positively by everyone, you know, because obviously mm. the, the truth of it is that it is still largely conservative in many areas, even though it excuse me, has not always been. That is the truth of it now. So opening myself up to have a conversation with someone who may say something where I, my instinct might be, wow, that's that's not the right way to say it or that's offensive or yeah. and instead being like, wait, no, that's their experience and that's what they know. And it's my job to be like, okay, here's what I know. I am going to make the effort to understand your point of view and you are going to make the effort to understand my point of view. So I think that's mm -hmm. like the number one thing I, I say is that leadership is about people and it's about differences in people and it's about building bridges with those differences. Um, Love that. So if I had to have like, yeah, that would probably be like the one thing which I keep going back to. Um, I think... In terms of just short, quick tips, I think, um, like, in some sense, leadership involves both, both planning and risk, would be my other one, um, mm -hmm. in the sense where it's very easy to, I think there's a, a common understanding of leadership that, okay, that means you're really organized and you're really, you know, everything that's going to happen in the day. And that's very much me. Like, I'm a Google Calendar person. I'm a, here's what's going on at every minute of my day. I have five alarms that, you know. But what I've learned is that leadership has to involve an element of spontaneity and risk and being open to going with the flow. Um, because as, you know, we were talking about 
things don't always go the way you want them to. And you need to know how to work despite that. So yeah. I think, yeah, if I have to have, if I had like three statements, which sum up my new perspectives on leadership since I've come back from my trip, it's leadership's about people, leadership's about differences and building bridges. And leadership is about planning to the best of your ability and being prepared for something to go wrong anyways. <laughs> and knowing that when that goes wrong, you can keep working through it. Love that. That is amazing. This is wonderful. Do you have, by the way, like a like a leadership, like a person who you see as a leader, who you admire, or is that, yeah. Not yeah, something... so actually I saw this on your list of questions and this was a question I was thinking the most about uh, oh. this morning um, because I think if you had asked me a month ago, I would have probably given you a big name. I probably would have said someone who is quite recognizable. But right now, the people who I've been the most impressed by in terms of leadership are the people I've interviewed over the past month. Mm -hmm. um, because they're not big names, all of them. They're not the people who are on the news. They're not the people who are, you know, going to be invited to global conferences or make statements which are going to be heard across the globe but they are doing amazing incredible work they are doing work which i could not dream of doing um i don't i wouldn't even know where to begin i'd be probably scared out of my mind mm -hmm. but they're doing it and i think that would be my fourth statement about leadership is that Leadership doesn't always need to be about changing the world. It can be about changing your own little pocket of the world and trying to make a positive impact in a five mile radius if that's what you can do. Um, yeah. Because these are people who, eat, you know, they're, they're doing grassroots activism where they can. They're fighting for their loved ones, even if they're not part of the queer community. If they have family who are part of the community, they're fighting on behalf of their kids and their parents and their siblings. And even if they're not activists, even if they're just living their lives, they're doing their best to live lives openly and proudly and kind of make a space for their families in societies which don't necessarily allow for that all the time. And I think that's kind of, I've been continuously just taken aback by the people I've been speaking to. I'm like, they are so amazing and they're so impressive. So I think if I had to highlight leaders who I now like look up to that would they would be it yeah nice that is amazing and I feel like that kind of describes some tenets of the the laid law foundation ethos I feel like you spoke a lot yeah. here about like brave curious determined which is how you I would describe this leadership style that you just described for your interviewees um so yeah that's that's amazing um okay so just a few more questions um so what is, I guess, what does it mean to you to be a lay law scholar? And then my last question that you can tie into that is, can you briefly describe a future you are striving to create? Yeah. To me, um, being a lay law scholar is about, I, I want to give a, you a good answer. So I'm going to take a minute and kind of bring together all my thoughts here. Um, <laughs> yeah, take a time. Yeah. I think to me, being a laid law scholar is about trying to change what I can change. It's about trying to make an impact in any way I can. It's, it's not, I think setting out a massively ambitious goal is always a good thing. But to me, it's about what's the next step forward. It's about kind of bringing together my, I, I, I've brought together my personal identity with this academic interest and that's wonderful. But I think my real fulfillment as a laid law scholar is going to come next year where I'm able to kind of work and perhaps have a tangible impact. Cause I think um, the academics are so it's wonderful and the research is wonderful. But to me being a laid law scholar means having a tangible impact. It means some, that, mm. you know, hopefully there's someone out there who can look at what I'm doing and be like, yeah, that has had an impact for me. Um, and I think that's going to be kind of the, I made it moment, you know, like I hopefully, <laughs> that, that is my biggest yeah. dream is that, you know, after next year, there are people living in India and Japan who can read what I've done or who I've worked with. And if you asked them, they could be like, yeah, this person has 
actually done something which has benefited us. Because that's my whole point is that it's, and that's why I was so determined to travel this year as well, because I don't think it's fair for me as someone who spent my whole life growing up in Western countries to sit in St. Andrews and research the experiences of people who live in South and East Asia and be like, yep, here's all my conclusions based on reading. Like, no, it's, it's about people. That's, yeah. I mean, you probably see this come up a lot as I'm speaking, but to me, it's all about people. It's about human history and it's about human mm-hmm. experience. Um, and to me, being a Layla scholar is about impacting the human experience in a positive way. So that would be my biggest dream. As, like my biggest personal dream is hopefully next year I could, I could text someone or call someone and be like, Hey, has, has what I've been doing actually had an impact for you? And they say yes. Um, and I would feel very proud of that. Um, That's amazing. So that goes into kind of the future that you're striving to create and yeah, yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So to wrap things up, I am going to, I lied earlier. It's not the final question. I'm actually going to give you a quick fire <laughs> question. Yes. Um, so um, these are going to be just a series of rapid answer questions and I'll start now. So what is your anthem just in general? What is your, your song, your jam? Uh, the entirety of the Hamilton soundtrack. Oh, I need to watch that. Like, I need to I watch Hamilton. Hamilton. Uh, I, like, lived in New York for so long, and I was like, I'm going to go watch it. And I never did, but I, I need to make a point of watching it. Okay, what are you currently binging on TV? Um, Jujutsu Kaisen. It's an anime. I'll put it in the chat as well, because that's... Oh, nice. Totally okay, um, the only anime yeah. that I'm, like, super into is Attack on Titan, which I need to pick back up. It got too emotional for me. Titan. It was too... It was Attack like. I was going to sleep stressed. I was like, oh my gosh, I did not realize yeah. a cartoon was going to make me this stressed out. Um, <laughs> what's your top book recommendation? Um, Probably the one that I'd mentioned before, Maurice by Ian Forster. Oh, nice. Okay. Do you have a podcast obsession? If so, which one? Um, this isn't something I listen to on my own, but whenever I'm with my family, we listen to Trivial Warfare, which is a, like a trivia quiz podcast. So that's oh. yeah, that's really cool. I should check that out, actually. Um, okay, so can you share something that made you feel joy recently, made you smile? Something that made me smile recently? Um, I went out with my friend for ice cream yesterday, and I hadn't seen her in a while, so that was very nice. Oh, that's so nice. Is that <laughs> a university friend? Yeah. my fr- She's also a Laidlaw scholar, so um, we were really excited when we both got into the program. But I don't I know. Mean... I feel like recently a lot of what I've been kind of thinking about is um, – how to find joy in like everyday things and how to find joy in, in small things like you know I, I made myself dinner and that, that was that made me smile so um mm. like my goal is like at least every day there should be a few things which I can think about which are like this has made me happy um, yeah. not just the, the big things yes same here I'm always like trying to like think and reflect on gratitude like just yeah be more grateful um so yeah uh, okay, last but not least, is there anything that you'd like to plug, perhaps a, a cause or an NGO that you're passionate about or a project that you're working on, or even just your social media accounts? Um, yeah, so one of the organizations that I was working with the most when I was in India, um, they're called Sweeker, the Rainbow Parents, and I will also pop that into the chat because I'm realizing these are not all straightforward spellings. Um <laughs> But they are a group of um, parents of queer youth uh, who work to kind of foster understanding and acceptance within um, families, especially uh, they're based in, in North India, so especially around Mumbai. And I think they're doing some really fantastic work to kind of bridge a gap between generations and between rural and city communities. Um, and I was very, very grateful to get the chance to speak with their members and and kind of I went to a film festival that they were massively involved in and that was a wonderful experience so yeah I I, they're doing some great work nice I'll post that in the in the chat below um or in the blog post um so yeah thanks for sharing that and this has been absolutely amazing and you're so inspiring so thank you so much for sharing your story and like it's just wonderful to see that you're providing more of a voice and expanded perspective um, from, you know, a subject area that has historically been, you know, ignored or uh, narrow-mindedly viewed, if that's a word. (laughs) 
but yeah, yeah so yeah that's I'm so glad very inspiring <laughs> thank you so much for uh joining us for the scholar spotlight I really appreciate you Aki and um I will put all of your LinkedIn and uh, ways to follow you in this blog post so um everyone can follow you and see what you're up to thanks so much everyone thank and so have much. a great day